We started a new series, uh, God's Road to Success, last Sunday. And uh, this week we want to look at God's Road to Success that involves faith and actions. Uh, we used to sing a song that went along with this. Real simple, it's called Trust and Obey. Anybody remember that song? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you remember that, Trust and Obey? The, the song, trust means faith. That's the Old Testament word for, one of the Old Testament words for faith is trust. And uh, action is obedience. I obey, trust and obey. And, and that's at the heart of our passage today. If you really want God's success in your life, you're going to have to have faith that's put into action, or you're just going to simply have to trust him and obey him. Now, I want to review. Last week, uh, God spoke to Joshua and said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now it's time for you to arise. Go across this Jordan into the land that I had promised him. Every place where the foot of your feet were, is going to land, that have I promised to give you, and it's your possession. You've got to go in and take it. He says, have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Man, you know, that's a promised guarantee of success, isn't it? You just have to do it. Well, next thing I notice that when I get to chapter 1, verse 10, Joshua ordered the officers, tell all the people, Three days from now, we will cross over the Jordan. Yeah, you got to stop and ask yourself, the Lord just told you to do this. Why wait three days? Well, I want to suggest that he has a strategy in mind, okay? He says, in three days, we're going to cross the Jordan that we're standing before, and we're going to go in and take the possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving us. He has a strategy, and a strategy is we're going to attack Jericho. So what I'm going to do, and we'll see it in a moment in the verses, I'm going to send some spies into Jericho and the land. I, uh, he's been in battle before. All you got to do is read the book of Numbers, and Joshua's fought battles before. And, and he's, what he's doing is, as the general, he's sending out, going to send out some spies to check out the land because he's about to go into the land and conquer it. And so he wants to divide the land in half. And a strategy seems to be split the land in half, then go towards the north and conquer the south and take possession of the land that God has promised us. Just let's go do it. But he's making preparation, developing a strategy. And in a strategy, we begin in chapter 2. The road to success led to Jericho. Jericho was a fortified city. We know from archaeology that it was a double-walled fortified city. We know from archaeology that one of the walls actually had houses on it, okay? And so things that all play in the text here. We know that from archaeology, the city was actually burned, destroyed. We know from archaeology that when it, the walls fell, it fell outward. We'll learn more about that when we get to the sixth chapter. He sent, Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, that's where they were, to go look over the land, and he said, especially Jericho. Jericho is the first place he's going in a strategy. I have to ask myself, why two spies? Well, you know, back in Numbers chapter 13, if you've read through your Bible this year, you've read that passage, you've probably forgotten by now because you're already in the book of Isaiah or Jeremiah. But in Numbers 13, 12 spies were sent into the land under Joshua 40 years earlier, or under Moses. 12 spies were sent in. They came back, and 10 spies gave a, a bad report, said, this place has got cities of huge walls and there's giants that live in the land and they, they, we're like grasshoppers in their presence. We can't take it. Oh, that we would go back to Egypt and be slaves all over again. You know, sometimes God gives us a tough assignment. Two spies came back. Joshua and Caleb said, this is the land that flows with milk and honey. He said, man, look at the cluster of grapes we got. It's, it's huge. It says, God, this is a God, place of God's blessing. Let's go take it. But they listened to the, 12, uh, the 10 and not to the two. So Joshua says, I'm going to skip the 10. Let's just go with two. That's my thinking. Text doesn't say that, but he sends two spies to check out the land. Well, the two spies, they go into the, the land, and, and the whole idea, if, uh, if I go back, it says, go, in, go, go sent two spies in secretly, secretly. Uh, you know, I thought, why do they put secretly in there? Isn't that the job of a spy? I mean, when an American spy goes to some other country, does he go and say, uh -oh, I'm the American spy here to check you out? 
He goes in disguise. He goes in deceptively. He goes in uh, incognito. He tries to blend in with the group. And so, so they went and they entered into the house of Rahab. Now, I want you to notice the rest of the story is about this gal Rahab because I want you to notice that the text says, so they went and entered the house of the prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. You got to ask yourself the question. Why did they go to a, re- to, to a prostitute's house? Doesn't that question pop up in your mind? Of all places to go? Well, think about it. They're incognito. They don't want to be recognized as uh, young Hebrew lads, you know, from the synagogue. And so what do they do? They go incognito. They're going to act just like the Canaanites. They want to dress like the Canaanites. They sneak in like a Canaanite. And where would they go and meet someone who had lots of information from loose lips and would be, uh, it wouldn't be unusual to have a stranger go there. The prostitute's place was it. What they didn't know, that in Providence, God was already working on this prostitute's heart. As we're going to see, she already has faith before they even arrive. Something has happened, and she's inclined, and God leads and brings the two spies to her place. She is, she is a prostitute. Now, I've noticed that some commentators try to you know, minimize this and say, well, you know, oftentimes uh, uh, an innkeeper was also called a prostitute, and, and maybe she was just an innkeeper. Well, when I looked in the New Testament, the New Testament translates this person as a prostitute. It actually comes from the word porn. Uh, what is porn? Porn is sex for sale. That's what she was doing, sex for sale. They lead her to this, this gal. It's, it's a divine encounter. God providentially bringing his two spies and this woman who, who has lived a, a life of illicit sex are brought together. What's interesting is what she did. What she did. She hid the spies. You see, what they thought they were incognito, it turns out they weren't incognito. They were, they were noticed. The king of Jericho sent his messengers to Rahab Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. Somewhere it either was leaked. (laughs) We got that problem today. (laughs) Either it was leaked that they were there to spy out the whole land, not just Jericho, or they noticed that and just jumped to that conclusion, that assumption. Anyway, the king of the city-state Jericho, he, he sends messengers there, and here's what she did. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and this is what she said. Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. Let me ask you, is that true? No. I love the Bible because it reports things honestly. Even people's lies. Do you notice this? This is a lie. This is a lie. Okay, let's go a little bit further. At dusk, when it came time to close the city gate, she said, the men left. They're not here. Where are they? They're at her place hiding. Well, is this the truth? This is a lie. This is a lie. I don't know which way they went. Well, of course she didn't know which way they went because... They hadn't went anywhere. (laughs) Go after them quickly. You can catch up with them. Could they? Well, no, they couldn't. It was all a lie. And some people say, oh, we got an ethical issue here. We got an ethical issue here. Here the hero of the story is. She's going to turn out to be one of the heroes of the story, a heroine of the story. She's lying. So does the Bible embrace lying? This is a good ethical question. And how do we resolve this dilemma? Most people ignore it, and I was tempted to ignore it too. (laughs) But in my personal belief, I believe that there's, uh, we have ethical standards, and one of the ethical standards that we all have, we share universally, is what we call, I call, a war ethic. In war, you, you always deceive. You don't tell the truth. Does the United States say, or in any of our wars, do we, well, Got to be careful with this one. Do we tell and broadcast to our enemy what we're going to do? 
you don't necessarily want to do that because if you broadcast and tell them what you're going to do, if they say, hey, uh, what kind of uh, aircraft are you bringing to us? Do we tell them? Uh, what day will that be? At what time? Why? They will take defensive measures. The whole thing with a spy, the whole spy thing is, the spies, it's all about deception. It's all part of a war ethic. In war ethics, you do whatever is necessary to protect your own. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? It's even true in Bible times. She had come, we're going to see, come to faith, and she is protecting her new allegiance. If I expose valuable information of the United States of America that brings the downfall of the nation, I am considered a traitor. A traitor, because we have a war ethic. And we all know that. We all understand that. I think that's what's going on here. So I'm going to minimize all this because I want to keep going on. She hid them. This is such a, a, a great thing that she did that in the New Testament, it says this. Uh, well, actually, in verse 6, it says, but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. I couldn't find any stalks of flax, so I got this hay. <laughs> all right? And you kind of see somebody, looks like somebody's hiding under there. She took them up on the roof, flat roof, and they had some stalks up there, and she covered them all up, and she hid them. And the New Testament, this is what it says that she did. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did. During World War II, there was a woman by the name of Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Christian. She was a watchmaker. She was in the Netherlands. The, the Nazis invaded the Netherlands. And she was part of the resistance. And people would come to her. The first one came to her and said, said, they've taken my father, my mother, my, my brother. I don't know where he is. And they've already questioned me. I'm afraid to go home because the Nazi might seize me. And Corrie Ten Boom, a Christian, took her in and became the first of many that she took in with the threat of her own life so that when the Germans came and said, are you harboring any of the resistance? Do you think she said, oh yes, I got them hidden in the closet. No. She said no. War ethics. She protected the life of those. And it didn't matter if they were Christian. It didn't matter if they were Jewish. It didn't matter who they were. She did not try to convert them. She just tried to save their lives. She tried to save their lives. James says she was righteous. She was righteous for what she did. She had a faith that she put into action. She risked her own self. She risked her life. She risked the life of her family. That was a great faith. You see, what she knew, and what she knew here is a great fear. She said to the, 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 the two spies, she said, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. That's exactly what God had promised in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. That they would, when they went into the land, God would cause a great fear to fall upon all the enemy, and, and, and God was doing that. She said, I know that the Lord, she knows the name of the Lord. This is Yahweh, the salvation God. She says, I know, I, I knew that the Lord had given you this land, and that great fear has gripped my entire nation. And you know what? She believed what she heard. What she heard is what God had done. This is what she heard. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you to come out of Egypt. You know how long ago that was? <clears throat> Forty years prior. Forty years prior. She said, I, I, we've known this for 40 years. And we must have had spies out there tracking, keeping track of you because we know what you did to Sion and Og. Now, these were two other kings of two regions on the other side of the Jordan River, the side of the Jordan River that Moses said led them to and Joshua was on at that very moment. You see, they went to uh, Sion and Og and said, hey, let us pass through your land because we're really not interested in your land. We want to go to the land God promised us. That's where we're going. And they, instead of saying, yeah, come on through, they came out to battle against them. 
and God delivered them both into their hands. And no, little did they know that this resistance paved the way so that fear rushed through the whole land of Israel, uh, then Canaan, among the Canaanites and all the people of the land. A and we heard what God did. Can I tell you something right now? The testimony in your life of what God did for you in saving and changing your life is the most powerful weapon you have. When people see you and see the way you live, it speaks more volumes than all the words you say. She heard what God did. When you allow God to do something in your life, people hear about it. They take note of it. We have heard. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing about the word of Christ. So I live the Christian life. And people say, wow, you're different. Why is that? Peter says, be ready to give every man the reason of hope that is within you. I live my life so people will ask, why are you so different? So that I can then tell them the word of God. I met Jesus, and Jesus changed my life. That's what's going on here. We have heard. She heard what God did. Here's what she believed. Now, I haven't taken the time to show you in the Hebrew text how this whole structure of the whole chapter is in a chiastic arrangement, which means nothing to you. But what it does mean is I'm to the very most important point of the way this book has been constructed in this chapter. It's like, did you ever have a, a sandwich that had a bread on top and bread on the bottom and then maybe you put uh, some kind of condiment on the, on, on the bread on one side and one on the other and then you put the meat in the middle, right? This is the meat in the middle. This is the heart. This is what he really is getting down to. This whole story comes to this one point right here. And this is it. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. This is a huge confession of faith. That's what it's all about. Rahab had come to the conclusion and has made this confession of faith. These guys weren't asking her to do this. She's telling them what she has already come to believe. Here's what happened. As the Israelites marched around to come into the land, they go through the land of Moab. Moab's God is Chemosh. Then they go up to, to you know, Sion and Og, where they're at. Uh, and they're a a a Amorites. And the Amorites have a God called Martu. Then they're going to go into Canaan. And they're going to come to this place of Jericho where their God is Baal. You notice something? They all got a different name God. <laughs> and every God was a God of that land. He was, he, he, was, he was just the God of that land. So if you went into another land, you're no longer in the territory that that God took care of. You're now in a new territory. There's a new God in this land. You go to another land. Oh, there's a new God over here. And what she is doing is she's abandoning all that faith. She is saying, listen, Yahweh, the Lord, Jehovah, that's the word capital L-O-R-D, all caps, the Lord is God. No, no. He's God in heaven above and earth below. This is a mirrorism. We found it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is no word for universe in the Hebrew language. In order to say universe, you use this mirrorism. You take two extreme opposites, the heavens and the earth. And what he is saying is, she's saying, just what Moses said in Genesis 1, 1. God is the creator of the whole universe. She was so out of step with her day where God is just the God of a local place. She abandoned him, her polytheism for monotheism, Jehovah God alone. We live in a very polyistic the, 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 theistic day ourselves. Only our new polytheism, multiple gods, is science, 
evolution, psychology, and we got a whole bunch of these, okay? And people fall down and worship them. I was talking to a young man not too long ago, and, and, and the young man said, well, you know, I'd like to be a believer, but I believe in science. And I wanted to, but I didn't. I was very polite. But I wanted to say, which science? The science of the 14th century, the 15th century, when they believed the earth was flat. <laughs> you believe in that science? What science? You believe in the science when, oh, of medicine, when they did bloodletting and they drained you because if you just drain your blood, you get rid of all your disease? What science? You, oh, you believe in today's science? Well, what are you going to do 50 years from now when this science is all negated? What science you believe in? You see, it's a, it's a well, you believe in science. And I said, well, I believe in evolution. I believe in the Big Bang. I said, okay, well, let's pop. stop, stop, stop. Where did all the stuff from the Big Bang come from? What, what, what was there 10 minutes before the Big Bang? And you know what happens? When I, when I say things like that, they're like a deer staring into headlights. Duh, I didn't think about yeah, do you really believe that everything that is was compressed down into some minute, tiny particle? Where did that particle come from? Oh, I don't know. Some of them actually say it was aliens. <laughs> and then I say, well, where did those aliens come from? <laughs> come on. I mean, I see children say, well, this doesn't make sense. This, you see... But we're considered out of step with our culture because most of our culture believes in this nonsense, this fairy tale stuff, that there is no God, that everything just came out of a big bang, but there's nothing before the big bang that they can account for, okay? She believes in the creator God of this universe. She believes. And this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, the prostitute Rahab because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She obeyed the message that they had all heard. They all received the message because they're all terrified. She's the only one who believed. The rest rejected, and they were disobedient. Here's what she received because of that, a promise, a promise of salvation. She said to them, she pleads with them, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness. I love this word, kindness. It's the word chesed. Chesed means loving kindness, steadfast love, covenant allegiance. It's the kind of love that you, you promise when you get married because it's involved with a covenant promise. Do you, will you love this person for the rest of your life? I will. Will you? I will. And then you have a ring that you put on, you know, that, to say this is the sign that we've committed ourselves to love one another and it's all wrapped up in what we call a covenant. This is the covenant word for love. It says, will you show me loving kindness to my family? See, she's concerned about her whole family because I've sworn I've just sworn this kind of loyalty to you and your God. Give me a sure sign. Now, give me a, a token. Give me the wedding ring, uh, uh, what I got, that, that I'm in, that I'm in, uh, that I belong, that, that this is all going to happen. Well, they don't give her a wedding ring, they, they, but they're going to give her a sign. Here's the sign she's asking for, that you will save us from death, that you will save us. Here's what they give. This is the oath. This is the sign. Our lives for yours. If this doesn't come to pass, we're dead. The men assured her that it would be their lives for hers. But they said, if you don't tell us, but if you don't tell what we are doing, uh, we will treat you kindly. But if you go telling them that we're here and you expose us, then, then it's all off. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. And so this is what she did. She received the promise. She let them down by a rope through the window because her house was one that was on part of the city wall. Just what Kathleen Kenyon and those before her who have excavated uh, Jericho have found, that there was a section of the wall that had houses on it. She let them down out of the window from the house that was on the wall and it says, the men said to her, this is the oath, this is our covenant, this is what we swore, this is what you made us swear. It will not be binding on us unless we, when we enter the land, we come in to take the land. 
You have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. You tie this on, you leave it there. It's a testimony to you and everyone else. You see, can't you imagine people in town saying, uh, hey, Rahab, what's, what's that cord dangling outside your, your window? Hmm. You see, once you become a Christian, you change. The people notice. And they're going to ask questions. They should notice. You should be changed. Your, your life should be different. And so she sent them away. And they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window from that day until they came back again. She receives. She's going to receive. Here's the promise of salvation. We'll see the salvation in chapter 6. I want to talk to you about what she became. Something happened that day. She became something. Joshua in chapter 6, verse 25 says, but Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute. After they conquered the land and the walls had all fallen down, her, her house was spared and, and all of her family. It says he spared her and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. She, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. I think I got to sleep. She did because they, she lives among the Israelites to this day. When, when the book was being written, she was still alive. She was still alive. She was spared because she had faith that was put into action that day. I call this becoming part of the family because she's living among them. She was brought into the family of Israel. I want to tell you what she achieved in a few remaining moments. She achieved, her achievement, she made history. What I mean is, when you jump to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, there's a genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a lot of names mentioned. In that list, there are three women who are mentioned. And the one that is mentioned is Rahab. I want to read this for you. A genealogy, uh, it's a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah. Judah was the father of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amenadab. Amenadab was the father of Nashan, and Nashan was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Wow. Rahab, Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Anybody remember Boaz? Some of you read my book, uh, the book, uh, and, and remember that, that Ruth, right? Ruth and Naomi. Naomi was her mother-in-law uh, on the side of Kilion, her first husband. He died. When she remarries Boaz, guess who her other mother-in-law is? Rahab. Rahab is Ruth's mother-in-law. You see how this all ties together? Rahab, okay. And so Boaz, she had, she, because Boaz was the father of Ob Ob Obed, that's a, that's a grandson. Obed was the father of Jesse, another grandson, a uh, great-grandson. And then Jesse, the father of King David. Oh, my goodness. God had great things in store for this woman her epitaph everywhere is the prostitute. You know, God hasn't come in. God has not chose the wise and the mighty, but he's chosen the low and the base things of this world that he might confound the wise and the mighty. He goes on later in the in genealogy. I'm not going to read through the whole list of names. It would be exciting, I'm sure, but... Uh, it says, thus there were 14, 14 in the generation and all from Abraham to David. There were 14 from David uh, to the exile in Babylon, and then 14 from the exile to the Christ. So I've done a little bit of homework on this, all right? Rahab turns out to be the great, great, okay, just say great 25 times or more, <laughs> grandmother of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? God's grace was awesome, was awesome in touching Rahab's life. The New Testament principle I take from all of this is three passages in the New Testament talk about her. 
by faith. The prostitute Rahab was not killed by faith. In James it says Rahab the prostitute considered, was considered righteous for what she did. Her faith was put into action. She acted on what she believed. And she had success. She becomes the great-great-grandmother of da David and the great-great-great-great-great 25 times or more of Jesus. Faith in action results in success. My final thoughts, I have several of them. First one is, God has a heart for sinners. We should never write anybody off as being too far gone. Ever, ever, ever. God has a heart for sinners. When we view somebody too far gone, then God said, you just don't understand. I have a heart for that person. Why did Joshua wait three days? I asked that at the beginning. You want to know why Joshua waited three days? Here's the answer. Because of the Rahab, the prostitute needed them to come for her to express her faith so that when the walls fell, she would be spared. God had a heart for Rahab. It's kind of like Jesus. Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 4, I have to... King James says, I must needs go through Samaria. I've got to go there. Why? What is in Samaria that's so important? Well, he had an engagement with this woman. She didn't know it. At 12 noon, she's, he's going to stop at the well in, that Jacob had dug in Samaria, and she was going to come out to fetch water, and he was going to have a conversation with her, and she was going to accept Jesus Christ as her Messiah. She's not too unlike Rahab. Jesus says to her, oh, go call your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He said, oh, you've answered correctly. You've had five of them, and the guy you're living with right now, you're not even married to. You're, you, you're so frustrated with marriage, you've just given up on the institution altogether. You're living in immorality. He hit her right between the eyes. And he said, I perceive that you're a prophet. Oh, you say you worship in Jerusalem. We say in, on, on the mountains of Samaria. And he said, hey, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. And it talks about the Messiah, and he says, I am he. The one that speaks to you, I'm he. That's me. I'm the Messiah. It's kind of like we looked at a week or so ago, that uh, the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery and often asked the question, where was the guy if they were caught in the act? They only pulled the, the woman because they figured they'd get away with this one. They, they brought, the, brought the woman. She's an adulterous woman. And then Jesus just stoops down. Why does Jesus just stoop down and write? Why does he just stoop down and write? Because Jesus has a heart for sinners. He stands up, where's your accusers? He's the only one that could accuse her because he's the only one that never did wrong. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Christ Jesus did not come into the world to condemn sinners, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, God has a heart for sinners. Sometimes I run into an individual who'll say to me that I'm just, I'm just too bad. I, I'm, I'm just such a, a terrible person that God could never save me. And I just want to scream out loud, baloney. My very final thought. There is no sin so great that our Savior cannot forgive it. Would you say that with me? There is no sin so great that our Savior cannot forgive it. I don't care what you've done, how great it is. It may trail you the rest of your life. Sure did Rahab. She's always called the prostitute. But God will forgive you, and he will remove it as far as the east is from the west. He will not bring it up on your account ever again. He will separate it from you. He will forgive you if you just call on him, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, all of us at some point or other feel like we are the worst sinner upon the face of the earth. Even the Apostle Paul said that he was the chiefest of sinners. And, and Lord, that's when our guilt overwhelms us and we know how could you use the likes of us. But you are a God who pardons like 
like the prophet said, who is a pardoning God like you? You forgive us. You remove it. And there is no one who's done anything so great that you cannot forgive them. Today, Lord, uh, encourage our hearts that we have a God who loves us so much, will pardon us and forgive us, make us part of the family. Lord, you'll give us a future and you'll make us make history. As you did for her, you'll do for us, even today. So even now in the quietness of this moment, if there's something, Lord, on our hearts, we're going to express that, not out loud, just in our heart. We're going to pray to you and say, Lord, I've blown it. Forgive me. I'm coming back home. I believe I'm going to act on my faith. I trust you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. I believe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
to believe that. You're a Christian. That's what you have to believe. Tonight we're having uh, our second of our three weeks and uh, three September uh, nights. And uh, we're studying the Jesus built life. Last week we talked about the great confession. Tonight we're going to look at the great commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how to implement that in your life. We want to encourage you to come. It's, it's topical. So if you miss a week, you didn't miss anything in sequence. You just missed that week. So we want to invite you to come tonight. We meet at 6.30. We start right on time. Try like crazy to end on time. And so it goes from 6.30 to 8. And we're just going to uh, study our Lord's words of the great commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor yourself. Please join us. Father, bless us now because we believe send us out as ambassadors for Christ. May people see our faith. Ask of us the reason of hope that's within us so that we can share about Jesus. Bless in this way we ask, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.